Yeah, hi, I'm Rye, uh, Rye Walker. Um, I am also light skinned. I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, white male. So uh, been doing uh, strong work since the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm uh, Greg Neheisel. Um, also here in the Cincinnati office with Rye. Um, also light skinned, got a beard and a dark shirt. Um, and yeah, chief architect and also founder. So been here the entire time along with Rye. Awesome. Thanks. All right, uh, go into the slides. All right, here we go. All right, so um, uh, real quick, I just wanted to give you a, an update on you know what we're focused on here at Astronomer. Uh, we're helping organizations try to realize business value from their data through workflow orchestration and Apache Airflow. Um, we're really focused on three things. Um, one is to help make Airflow itself better. Uh, we've got thousands of deployments under our belt. You know, we helped guide Airflow 2 into existence. Um, and now we have about 20 of our team members in the, amongst the top tw uh, top 50 uh, Airflow uh, contributors. Um, so we're putting a lot of energy there. Uh, we had a couple of great talks yesterday with um, some of the Airflow team members. Uh, I encourage you to watch. Uh, secondly, we're working on making it uh, running Airflow better. So uh, we contributed a rewrite um, to the scheduler uh, for it to be HA uh, back for Airflow 2.0. Um, uh, we contributed our Helm chart to the project um, around the same time. And we remain focused on, um, you know, making numerous per performance improvements to the project um, and uh, projects around the core. Um, so, um, so and then three, we really want to make it easier for multiple teams to adopt Airflow inside of organizations. Um, a lot of organizations run an airflow monolith uh, filled with critical pipelines, and that's a tough spot for others to contribute to. So we're working to make it easy for teams to spin up um, their own airflow clusters uh, so they can isolate that risk. So, and today we wanna share a little bit about um, the progress we're making on our next gen SaaS offering, uh, and hopefully pique your interest to sign up for early access. So. Um, you know, first of all, it's a, a question would be like, why are we working on a next gen SaaS offering? Um, well, currently we have a SaaS offering where the Airflow infrastructure runs in our cloud, which we call Astronomer Cloud. Um, we also have uh, Astronomer Platform, which is self-managed software that you can run in your cloud. Um, many of our customers and prospects have told us they want it all. They want the security of running uh, airflow within their infrastructure, but they also want the no DevOps convenience that our fully managed SaaS astronomer cloud provides. So we've been busy working on, on this, uh, a product that's, um, again, still called astronomer cloud, but it is fully managed, um, in the same way that our current SaaS is managed. However, all the infrastructure airflow infrastructure will run in your cloud. So, um, this addresses the need to put um, workflow orchestration close to your data, you know, reducing the data gravity effect. It also helps with a lot of security um, uh, concerns. Um, so uh, Greg's gonna um, show you a little bit about what we've been working on. Greg, go ahead. Thanks, Ry. <clears throat> um, yeah, so we just kind of want to jump into the, the high level architecture, um, get, get kind of like a technical peek under the covers of how this whole thing will work, this thing we're putting together. Um, so, uh, you know, it's really divided into two planes here. Uh, what we call the control plane uh, and the data plane. So the control plane is, is kind of what users uh, interact with. It's a SaaS application, typical kind of SaaS uh, software. Um, it's It acts as the source of truth um, in a lot of ways. And uh, in the data plane, the bottom part here is, is really acts as the execution environment for all of your, your actual Airflow deployments. Um, and this, this actually runs in, in your, your cloud as a customer. Um, the control plane is, is running in our cloud. Um, and like Rice said, this is really to address this, this data gravity uh, problem uh, in a secure way. You know, a lot of folks have um, a lot of private data resources living in a bucket or a database or something, it's all, typically within a VPC or, or a group of VPCs that, that, uh, that a company owns. Um, and here, you know, in this, uh, maybe, th th everything runs on Kubernetes here. So, you know, at the end of the day, we're spinning up a, a Kubernetes cluster 
in your cloud uh, to, as, to serve as the execution environment for all of, all of your Airflow deployments. Um, so everything you can do against our system is, is expressed through this Astro API, which is a GraphQL uh, API. Really serves as like the front door for anything you're gonna do against our, our platform. Um, you know, we use a couple couple different data sources behind the scenes or, or data stores, um, you know, one of which is Vault. You know, it's, we, you know, users have to turn over some sensitive information for this architecture to work. And that's kind of how we, we store this those uh, pieces of information securely. Um, but the next piece is this, this Astro cluster API. Um, this piece of this service um, is, is really responsible for, for managing cluster creation and updates. Um, and by cluster, we mean the Kubernetes cluster and a little bit of the surrounding infrastructure, uh, like a network um, and those sort of things. This is, you know, think CloudFormation, you know, Google Deployment Manager, ARM templates on Azure, um, that sort of thing. You know, we're, we're, we're spinning up cloud infrastructure for you um, on your behalf. Um, yeah, and then we have this this Harmony system, which which we'll get into. We'll, we'll drill into a couple of these these subsystems uh, in depth later on. But this Harmony system, you know, uh, is a component running in our cloud, and there's a component running down in you know the data plane, what we call the data plane, the customer's cluster. Um, and this is this is really responsible for um, ex or extending desired state down into your environment. Uh, we'll get into that what that means in a little bit here. Um, and then you know you know you know assuming you have airflow deployments running in this this cluster um, all access through to those airflow deployments think you know hitting the airflow api or uh, pulling up the airflow dashboard to look at logs or trigger a dag or all that all the stuff uh, you know most folks are normal or uh, used to this all runs through a proxy a secure proxy that we run in our control plane uh, and it proxies all those requests through. So, you know, as a user, you really are only interacting directly with our control plane. And this data plane is purely the execution environment for these airflows. Um, and this integrates with our astronomer runtime for airflow. Uh, we'll get into that, what that is in a, a little more depth here, um, but it's, it's, it's responsible for, for actually running your airflow deployments, spinning up the infrastructure, like, you know, all the, all the components and we'll get into what, what all those are here in a minute. Um, we use uh, Istio service mesh um, kind of throughout both planes. Um, this is really our approach to zero trust networking, um, you know, through and through. And this is, we kind of use it to do token validation as as, pa as requests kind of pass through this network of, of um, microservices and also does uh, mutual TLS throughout. Um, so that everything's encrypted as, as it kind of passes through these these lines here on this diagram. Um, yeah, moving on. I mean, the, you know, if you're familiar with Airflow, you may know that Airflow emits stats D metrics. Um, we are collecting those with Prometheus and a in a stats D exporter um, down in the data plane. But all that, all these metrics, you know, from all of your many Airflow deployments are all kind of are all coming up um, into this this system called Thanos, uh, it's an open source tool as well. Um, but this is really gonna serve as like the backbone of a lot of our observability stack that we're gonna bring into this product. And it's really in an effort to give users, um, a, you know, a single pane of glass, if you wanna call it that, across all of their deployments um, kind of as a whole. Um, yeah, and we also have this, this CLI tool um, if you're, not familiar with it. Uh, it's, it's very similar to the, the CLI that existed in the, the products that Rai mentioned earlier, but it's really used for rapid development of DAGs on your on your laptop as a, as a DAG developer engineer. Um, it's really built to help, in addition, it's, it's built to help you automate things through our API, just the way that our UI does. Um, you can also use our CLI to run these commands. Um, uh, you can use it to script things up, build automation of your own to control your your airflow environment uh, within Astronomer. And last, um, you know, logs, airflow log. We're using the built-in. You know, today we're using the built-in um, logging providers. You may be familiar with um, S3, Google Buck. You know, all the bucket-backed logging. So right now, 
that's where we're pushing all the logs. Um, in the future, you know, there, there will be more options. Um, a lot of folks have their own logging tools, Datadog, Splunks, you know, those, there's plenty more. Um, and we, we wanna offer first class integrations with those as well. So that's coming soon. A quick note about that whole architecture is that, um, you know, all connectivity is initiated from the customer's data plane. Uh, this, this, this really means that, um, you know, you don't have to poke any inbound firewalls, you know, so in, inbound firewall rules. So we don't have to address you or anything. We don't have to poke any holes in. The data plane uh, connects up to the control plane um, to, do, to do everything it needs to do, <clears throat> which is nice from a security perspective. <clears throat> So moving on, we're gonna zoom into this, that, uh, that yellow box, the airflow runtime. You know, what is this thing? So this, the astronomer runtime uh, can really be thought of as a, maybe a persistent supervisor running in each, in each cluster. You know, this is part of the baseline software that we spin up when we, when we give a customer a new cluster. Um, and it really manages, you know, everything about all the running components you need to run in airflow, you know, depending on the configuration. You got a web server, you got a scheduler, Schedulers, workers, um, maybe Redis if you're using Celery, that sort of thing. Uh, but this really manages all the upgrades, the migrations, health checks, auto scaling, and, and just all the other maintenance involved with keeping an Airflow deployment up and running and healthy. Um, so one of the goals of this that we're pretty excited about is to you know drive Airflow to scale to zero. You know. I'd say a typical airflow deployment out there is kind of running all the time. Maybe not, maybe you, maybe some folks have kind of worked out a way to, to do some auto scaling different ways. Um, we, re we really wanna take it all the way. You know, We wanna make the entire airflow uh, deployment auto scale down to zero and scale horizontally um, you know, on autopilot essentially. So you know, we're looking at um, a couple of things here. Um, you know, there's a lot of work. That, I mean, there, you know, one thing is the for the web server. So this one's a little tough. Uh, we'd love to do. This is something we do not have quite worked out yet. Um, but we want to auto scale the web server down when you're not using it. Um, right? If you're not hitting it, there's no reason to be running that thing. So um, it's a little tough right now. I think something we have to do to make this work is to solve this with you know what's called like a cold start problem. You know, Airflow web server is today is a little bit sluggish to boot up. So if you were scaled down to zero and you, you fire a, a request into this thing, it's gonna take a little bit to spin up and uh, it's not quite the experience we'd like at this point, but we're gonna work on that. Uh, that's something we're gonna work on. So coming soon. But something we are doing uh, today already with customers and our, our previous products that we're gonna bring in as a first class citizen into our new product is um, using uh, Kata. Kata auto scaling to to do a custom um, to do custom auto scaling with Airflow workers um, at a minimum, and th this could be extended into scheduling in the future. Uh, something we're looking at, but it really this this is different than a Kubernetes auto scaler. You know, the typical horizontal pod out auto scaler. Really, you know, you configure it to look at things like CPU and memory, and if your CPU reaches a threshold, spawn another worker. It's not great for Airflow. Um, you know, users of Airflow will know not all tasks are the same. Um, Airflow is more slot based in some ways. You know, um, it doesn't really work perfectly with the, the built-in kind of Kubernetes auto scalers. So what Kata does, or what we've configured Kata to do for us, is to look at Airflow's meta database, look for all the running and queued tasks, and then spin up you know, an appropriate amount of workers def depending on how many task slots you want to assign to a given worker. So like I said, it's more slot based than CPU or memory based. Um, this allows for what we've been calling, you know, zero cost worker queues. Um, what we're going to expose to the to customers is a way to spin up different machine or, or pod profiles in Kubernetes. Um, Maybe GPUs, maybe you know, high CPU, high memory, you know, whatever it is to fit the workload you're thinking, and you can kind of create several of these. And we call them zero cost because these should scale down to zero whenever there's a task not running on them. So you're free to kind of build your infrastructure out ahead of time, not cost you any money, 
And then as you fire tasks into these queues, you know, then, then the workers will spin up and, and start taking the load. Um, but yeah, that's, that's our plan. You know, we want to make airflow scale to zero as a whole. Um, yeah, so just uh, zooming in here a little more um, on how DAG deployment works within this system. Um, you know, the astronomer platform that we mentioned earlier has historically um, allowed for one method of DAG deployment. Um, you know, what we typically do is we'll bake them into the image um, along with all the dependencies. So our CLI we mentioned earlier um, really takes care of, you know, building and pushing um, a, a final image that includes your DAGs and includes your Python dependencies and includes your OS dependencies and anything else you may need as part of your Airflow runtime. Um, and this is, you know, when you, when you do that push with our CLI, um, you know, you generate a new image, a new tag with, with this new, with these new contents. And this is relayed down to the control plane through this Harmony system, which we'll zoom into here in a minute. Um, you know, th th this method will be, you know, supported in Astronomer Cloud first and foremost and kind of and serve as, you know, the underlying foundation um, for, for the future. But the problem is, is that this method makes no distinction between uh, changes in the underlying image, such as packages, airflow version, um, any custom dependencies you may have, um, and then the actual DAGs. You know, so that, that's a big, you know, a lot of times you get your image in the right, um, you know, correctly configured with all your dependencies and everything, um, kind of less often than you would deploy DAGs. That's just kind of the pattern we've seen um, throughout the years is that, you know, DAG, DAG updates are actually a lot more frequent than needing to update a package or, or anything like that. So uh, we, what we want to do is, is kind of decouple the two, um, build on top of what we have and, you know, allow users to deploy DAGs um, in different ways, you know, maybe maybe through an API, maybe through a, a GitHub integration. Um, we're still working out on what we want to expose, uh, but our our our, um, our existing functionality will continue to 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 run just just as it always has, and we're going to layer on new new ways to get those DAGs in and uh, deployed uh, without without being as disruptive. Um, so that that's what that's the next kind of problem with the you know the baked in. Uh, method of deployment is that it, it does require a restart of all your airflow processes uh, somehow at some point in time, whether it's a worker scheduler, um, web server with DAG serialization no longer needs that, um, which is great. But, um, you know, we've done a lot to make this as as less as as least of a disruptive process as possible. But, you know, there's always there's room for improvement here. So um, we're going to keep working through that and offer some new some new ways to layer your DAGs on. Um, through through this the system, <laughs> um, you know maybe this 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 is a, a feature we're, we're proud of, um, but you know it may not be the most exciting from a <laughs> from an engineering perspective. Uh, but you know this is this is uh, what, what we're giving you is pretty much um, the ability to configure single sign-on for all of your Airflow deployments. You know wherever they may be running um, across multiple clouds, but you can bring your own identity provider, um, whether it's Okta, Google, um, Active Directory, any of those things. Um, we'll let you kind of pull that in and kind of use that um, identity provider as uh, the authentication mechanism for all your users in your organization. Um, and this figure here is just really showing, you know, how this kind of interacts with that secure proxy to access your your airflow deployments running down in the data plane. Um, and, you know, in addition to this, uh, we'll also have this, this notion of service accounts. Um, you know, we have this in our, our original products. We'll have this uh, carried through in the new product. And these service accounts really let you, they're really geared towards automation, um, scripting, anything you can do through our astronomer UI, you should be able to script um, up through the CLI. and and manage with a service account. You know, a lot of folks use this to do CI, CD kind of DAG deployments um, and or automate spinning up a new deployment uh, or changing the parameters of those deployments. So everything should be scriptable and that's that's what this will allow folks to do. <clears throat> so 
So moving on, um, you know, the next step of the, you know, the security story here is, is authorization, you know, policy management. Um, you know, what, you know, in addition to bringing your own IDP to the table, uh, we've, we've made some adjustments to our system, you know, from the, from the previous generation to allow for more fine grained, um, policy management, you know, so this will essentially let organization owners uh, define policy, um, meaning like who in my organization is allowed to do what to what airflow deployments. Um, so, you know, as, as how this works under the hood, you know, as um, roles are defined and added to the system, we store them in a policy database. Um, this is, uh, you know, using uh, some open source tooling here. Um, but, uh, you know, we this library that we're using supports a couple of different models, ACL, RBAC, um, ABAC, you know, so, but we're, we're kind of choosing RBAC is what we're going to be working with. So role-based, um, everything will be role-based, <clears throat> um, pretty standard. You know, when, when, and when policy decisions are kind of encountered through this, this through this, system, whether it's something you're trying to do at the control plane or something you're trying to do within a particular airflow deployment, um, it'll flow through this kind of single policy um, system. So what we have shown here is, you know, just how this policy also applies to those airflow deployments running down in your data plane. Um, so what happens here is, you know, as you, as a, as a customer, as a user um, is, is interacting with an airflow web server and airflow deployment, um, you're you're making a request up against our secure proxy. Um, this proxy will know who you are because you've authenticated with our system. And as it's passing through, we'll attach policy to these requests going down um, in real time. So this, again, kind of interacts with, you know, this this astronomer runtime, uh, this, this supervisor, you know, system that's kind of running down in, in airflow or down in the data plane. Um, and we have a custom security manager. Uh, that's an, air, an airflow term, if you're familiar. Um, it's it's a uh, essentially a plugin to Flask App Builder, uh, which is what Airflow's web UI is all built on top of. Um, but rather than using the you know the default fab tables and roles, um, we use this 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 custom security manager that we have installed in all of our all of our images. Um, and this really delegates the whole thing up to the control plane. So we really have, up at our control plane, we really have really fine-grained control, the ability to expose very fine-grained control to our users. So this will open up a lot of possibilities in the future. Um, but, you know, that was a key thing, you know, as we were building this new system, we wanted to, you know, not rely on the built-in airflow roles uh, that, that come with airflow, but really, you know, be, have the ability to really manage it at a very fine grained level from the control plane. Um, so that's, that's that. <clears throat> um, yeah. And then, you know, zooming in, zooming in a little bit on this um, harmony system we've talked about a few times. This is, this is kind of interesting. We thought we'd throw it in here. Um, you know, a little peek under the covers, but this was, this was kind of a, one of those classic, you know, build versus buy decisions. You know, this is, it, and it's really it really kind of boils down to you know how do we store how do we store and manage cluster state you know this is these are Kubernetes clusters running down there there's pods that need to be running uh, one way or another we need to essentially store all that information up at the control plane while applying that state uh, to run to run down on these uh, you know child or downstream clusters uh, running in the data plane so. Um, that was a problem, you know, we, we want to, how, how do you do this at scale? Um, you know, with, with lots, lots of uh, data planes and lots of airflow deployments. Um, how does it, how does it grow when, when things get more complicated in the future? How do we roll out controlled updates? You know, when there's a new version of the data plane software, you know, there's how do we roll that stuff out in a controlled way, maybe do a canary release. How do we perform like an emergency rollback? Um, should that, should we need to, um, you know, so we were looking all around for, for solutions here. Um, you know, this is, you know, kind of really, if you've been in the Kubernetes community, this is 
somewhat related to Kubernetes Federation, which has you know, gone through a couple of iterations. Um, by no means is a, <laughs> is a solved problem um, at this point, but you know, th th those, those solutions didn't quite work. Uh, so we looked kind of outside for maybe a vendor, you know, are there any outside off the shelf solutions that help us do this? Um, it seems like, seems like this will be a problem that our fo other folks out there might have. Um, so we, we were looking around, but really, I think, you know, most of those off the shelf or products that already exist really are really geared towards, um, Enterprises that have a lot of clusters, you know, just a single organization that has a bunch of Kubernetes clusters, wherever they may be. But it really relies on the fact that, um, you know, your central Kubernetes cluster has API access, you know, over some, you know, secure network to all of your other clusters. Um, so it, it kind of violated that one thing that we wanted to do was be, um, well, we wanted to be a pool-based model, first off, um, such that these data planes could or were responsible for connecting up to the control plane rather than the control plane poking a hole into the data plane to do any kind of communication. Uh, that was kind of a security tenant we had uh, from the get-go. Um, but uh, we also had to operate under the assumption that these data plane clusters are hostile environments. You know, we don't we don't know who's going to be spinning this up um, in the future. You know, once once this is a fully self-service um, system, you know, we don't know. We don't know who's going to be spinning one of these up. We don't know, you know, if they're, you know, it's running in your cloud account as a customer. So um, you have access to some degree. You know, whoever created that account in the first place will have, you know, like a root account would would still have access to these things. So you really do have to treat them as a hostile environment. So we really you know, decided to, you know, keep everything in the control plane and really just keep these data plane clusters as just the execution environment, you know, like all it's doing is running your airflow. It's doing exactly what the control plane tells it to do. If this thing gets blown away, if the data plane disappears one day, you should be able to bring it back, you know, with, with little, with little effort. Um, it's kind of a disaster recovery type of thing. Um, so how does this work? You know, well, we we had a we, you know. So bottom line is we you know we could not find something off the shelf anywhere that really hit every single kind of bullet point we needed. So we made the decision to kind of build this build this system ourselves. Um, you know, so how does how does this work? You know, what, what we have here is this this purple line um, at the top. This is really you know a user or our system taking some kind of action that affects the state of the cluster, the downstream cluster. Um, whether it's someone added a new deployment or someone changed the parameters of a particular airflow deployment, or we add a new kind of foundational component. We change our, you know, our Prometheus configuration, that sort of thing. Um, you know, so, so as requests come in to this Harmony API to say, Hey, you know, we're, we're trying to update something here. Uh, we, we execute a corresponding, what we call plugin that generates an immutable blob of Kubernetes manifests. Um, and stores it off in a bucket, and this, you know, and, and then actually, you know, makes a record of that blob in a database um, at the end of the day. So, what we have at the end of the day is a big, big blob of Kubernetes YAML <laughs> or JSON uh, sitting in a bucket, and then separately out of band, this Harmony client will connect, you know, like you know, connect up to the control plane, subscribe to updates for that particular cluster that it's identifying itself as. Um, and we'll listen for any, any changes to this, this um, you know, the, the, the cluster state represented as this, as this big blob. Um, when a change is detected or when it's initially booting up, um, it will pull that whole blob down into, its, into, it, into itself and then apply it to the, the Kubernetes cluster that it's running in um, and just kind of keep doing that, you know, and it's just kind of listening for updates, waiting for a change to come in and then it applies itself. And if that connection is severed for whatever reason, you know, some kind of outage, whatever things happen, um, you know, these airflow deployments running, you know, in this astronomer runtime will continue to run, you know, the, you know, assuming you don't need to go to the internet for your data sources, which kind of defeats the point of the whole thing. Um, you know, you should be peered with your network. You should be able to access all of your data resources. 
your airflows will continue to run, auto scale, everything like that will still continue to work just fine. Connectivity is reestablished, Harmony reconnects. So anything different? If there's some, if there's changes, it'll apply it then. If there's not, you know, no, there's no action needed. So, um, you know, really built with that disaster recovery um, kind of at the at the forefront as well. So that, you know, if if some kind of disaster does happen, someone messes up, deletes this cluster, or or anything like that, um, you know, we'll we'll be able to bring everything right back just the way it was uh, without without too much trouble. <clears throat> yeah, awesome. Thank I, think you. I, think, I think we're back to you. <laughs> yes, thanks for that uh, amazing uh, <clears throat> overview and deep dive into a few of these uh, topics. So wh what I wanted to close out, close out the talk with is, is talking a little bit about um, how, uh, how how this could have been beneficial to us in the past, I guess. <laughs> uh, like I, I see a big be benefit of this approach uh, for this next gen cloud is is how it can help you escape the monolith. So let me ex explain what I mean by that. When we when we got started using Airflow about five years ago, we had one big Airflow deployment that was populated dynamically by one Python file. Uh, it would read from a Mongo database and generate hundreds of DAGs. Each of those DAGs had about 100 tasks in them, and they were running hourly. So we had 24 by 7 by 365, um, millions of these mission-critical task instances. Uh, each of the DAGs represented a customer of ours. And so you know, if any one of the DAGs was uh, slow or, or failed, um, it was a red alert. So this was very stressful uh, to, to watch. Um, it, was, it was tough to... Uh, to scale, um, and, and we really wanted these hourly jobs to run as quickly as possible. Um, but as the de as the deployment got overwhelmed, as our product grew, like I said, all of our customers were affected, and we just ended up having to keep throwing more and more compute resources at it, wondering where the breakpoint will be. Um, and I'm sure this sounds somewhat familiar to anyone who's running a big airflow <laughs> cluster. You know, as 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 more and more work gets thrown at it, so. Um, on top of that, if we wanted to run like a backfill or if we had to um, rerun a period of time for somebody, uh, we had to scale up temporarily with a lot of guesswork and kind of watch anxiously as the backlog was burnt down. Um, sometimes we had to like pause some DAGs, you know, to allow higher priority DAGs increased access to the compute resources. So once again, I'm sure we've all been there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Greg laughs because he remembers these days, uh, yeah, days. <laughs> very, very painfully. <laughs> yes. So, so if, if back then we would have had our next gen scale to zero uh, astronomer cloud, we could have created an airflow deployment per customer, and that would have increased our parallelism like dramatically. Um, you know, from a single CI/CD script instead of a Python file, we could have we could have hit our API, created these things. Once the hourly DAG completes, um, which in some cases, you know, for some of our customers, was it would just take a few minutes to run through them. Uh, others, it took tens of minutes. Uh, the deployment could go idle, and we wouldn't be paying for anything anything for the rest of the hour. Um, and and because all the metadata in this case in the next gen astronomer cloud is feeding up to our control plane, we'd still have a single pane of glass uh, to monitor all the pipelines. So. That's the challenge with many airflows is, you know, there isn't a good centralized um, dashboard to see what's going on across them. Um, that's a big part of what we're aiming to solve here with this product. So in a way, you know, we're building the product right now that we always wish we could have had back then. And again, I think a lot of you feel the same way. Uh, and, and I think uh, you all uh, see the value of escaping the monolith uh, with smaller auto scaling fully scale to zero airflow deployments. Um, another use case uh, for next gen astronomer cloud is, is the ability to spin up these auto scaling airflow deployments uh, is to give access to other teams in your organization, their own deployment without you having to manage them, uh, you know, even across multiple clouds. So again, like it's become a multi-cloud world in a lot of organizations. Um, if, if you're running Airflow on, you know, in AWS, for, for example, and someone wants it in Google Cloud, um, it's a big ask for you to try to develop the expertise and, and, and figure out the right way to, to make that work on that other cloud. So um, 
we've basically bundled up all that knowledge, all that know-how, all that DevOps into into a software. Um, and so, you know, it's, as as it's becoming more common for data engineering teams to emerge in finance and operations, in addition to more traditional areas like data science and marketing and product, you know, we're providing a UI, a CLI, an API to make make it as easy as possible for all these teams to leverage the power of Airflow. So. Um, if, if what we're building is interesting to you, uh, we'd invite you to apply for early access. Uh, the applications are actually opening up right here at this moment. Uh, and with some exceptions, we plan to process customers in the order that we receive the applications. So it only takes a few minutes to fill out the form. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. 